My name is Harvey Bodega, and welcome to Lost Eden. The evil Morcus Rex leads his Tyrannosaurus armies against the peaceful societies of Mashar, of which Adam, prince of the Citadel of Mo, must unite different cultures and species against the Saurian invaders. Cutting through all this mumbo jumbo? This is the Tolkien Dinosaur Game. Do you think the sun means something? Developed by Cryo and published by Virgin Interactive, Lost Eden was released in March 1995 for MS DOS, Macintosh, 3DO, and CDI to generally positive reviews. A few may recognize Cryo, maybe for 1992's adventure hybrid adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune, but where myself and likely many others recognize them is as publisher for Ring, The Legend of the Nibelungen, made famous by Mandalore Gaming's fantastic review. Virgin, on the other hand, has been mentioned on this channel before as the would-be publisher of Thrill Kill prior to being purchased by Electronic Arts, but printed some great games in the 80s and 90s. Day of the Tentacle, Blade Runner, Double Dragon, Prince of Persia, Command and Conquer, Night Trap, and Color a Dinosaur. As the collaboration between two companies who knew adventure games, let's see how they did with Lost Eden. Being a point-and-click adventure, you can expect the genre staples like point and and click it, but we have a scrollable inventory, a directional spinning dice to move, and a place to speak with your party. There's an overworld, a few puzzles, light strategic components, and some areas have a mini-map, which is all well and good. But my immediate worry with adventure games like this is how unforgivably obtuse, inaccessible, and or generally hostile they'll be to the player. You know, soft locks, the adventure game purgatory, random deaths, illogical puzzles, stuff like that. I'm happy to say that Lost Eden has none of those things. Sure, you'll stumble through a lot of illogical bizarreties, but there's generosity in preventing confusion. For example, early on you get a seashell from a dying dinosaur, and using it on yourself gives him a call in the afterlife for a point in the right direction. While he's meant as a failsafe, just talking to people in your party or using items on them is a great source of information. I get this blob of pixels from an insane looking dude. What is it? I wonder why the Tamnian gave you a bag of earth. Oh, uh, cool. Consumable items needed for quests respawn to avoid unwinnable states, too, and according to the manual, you can call a 24-7 automated tip line for 75 cents, get a hint sheet faxed to you, or even one sent to you via snail mail. Some of you may not appreciate this, but isn't that adorable? Man, gaming was just different back then. You don't even really need to read the manual, although it does tell you how to save, which is by talking to yourself, but the point is Lost Eden is very accessible. A few minor frustrations do crop up in exploring for something on the minimap that you know is there but isn't marked yet, so you have to systematically snake through the map. Kind of tedious. More so as each area also has a Massasaurus you need to speak with hidden in one water tile, but you have to find them, and in order to do so you have to watch sort of the slow fish swimming animation a bunch of times. The spinning dice pointer has a delay before indicating the direction, so I oftentimes clicked too quickly and went to the wrong place. And lastly, a symptom of many adventure games from any era, really, is you need to talk to the same important person many times in a row. It doesn't matter if they cut off the dialogue. Click on them again until the dialogue loops. I was often given an item after a third click, so just something to be aware of going in. In speaking about a game of this genre from this era, if those are really my main critiques, if that's all I got, it's fair to say that Lost Eden has aged incredibly well and is rather intuitive from a gameplay perspective. To be clear, none of the mechanics are super innovative or spellbinding, but the gameplay is pleasant and simple. It may not seem like it at first, but Lost Eden and a lot of Cryo's work really focus on impressive presentations. This may look like a noodle saurus to your modern civilized eyes, but it was more than enough to get a 90s kid to take off their sock and boppers and pay attention. Impressive are the variety of animated transitions, like traveling on the world map, walking from one area to the next. The opening cutscene is striking too, and while they're well done examples of dated animation work, thankfully you can skip any of them if you want to. The flickering torch animation hurt my eyes, and I'll say some of the dinosaur movements vary from stilted to goofy, but I found myself consistently charmed by the effort and attention to detail. This probably came at a cost though, because environments are pretty barren. At the beginning, you're walking through the Citadel of Mo, an allegedly impenetrable fortress that stopped the vicious tide of Saurian invaders the last time they attacked, but it has like five people in it. That's true for regions too, whether you're going to the home city of the pterodactyls or talking with a native tribe. They're treated as if they represent an entire ethnicity or country, but you'll never see more than a half dozen people at a time. 
That said, the character design is mostly original and creative, with a few goofy standouts. Bug scene dinosaurs. The one that weirdly bothered me the most was Adam, your character. What are you smirking about? People are getting eaten by dinosaurs every second. Fix your hair, you little turd. But the only one that I thought was legitimately funny, like in a bad way, was Morcus Rex. He looks like an anime action figure or something, and his talking animation looks screwed up. That's right, each of these characters has a talking animation, and they're mostly well done, simplistic ways to add character. But a few have gestures that repeat a little too fast to seem natural. Yes, this lady will ride on a pterodactyl at one point, which will really complete the heavy metal vibe. I found the visuals to be incredibly endearing, but I'm more attached to the audio. While the ambiance and effects are simple, there are clear artistic flourishes. The voice acting is another surprising achievement. I know I keep comparing Lost Eden to games of that era, and it doesn't mean anything to a player who would play today, but the voice acting continues the theme of aging really well. Now, I'm a fan of bad, hammy 90s voice work. Who is it? Who do you think it is, sweetheart? Your fairy godmother? But besides being a little overacted or cheesy at parts, all the voice actors and actresses did really well. Our citadel will soon be a proud bastion. Go to Shamar with my blessing. Leave the valley. I have no intention of going with you. Adam, what are you both doing here? I didn't love this, ladies. This gift is for you. I found it myself in a cave in the northwest of our valley. But many had lost Eden as one of their first credits prior to continuing on a long, successful voice acting career. That's all well and good, but I'd argue not just great for the era, but great for any era, is the soundtrack. Stefan Peek, composed from the late 80s to 1998, mainly just for cryo, but holy cow, he did an amazing job. Combining synthesized vocals with bombastic, traditional-sounding instruments creates a mystic, fantastical score, definitely in my top three soundtracks that I've covered for the channel so far. I heard this track a lot and still returned to it outside of the game because I enjoyed it so much. While clearly dated and rudimentary for today's standards, I definitely think aspects of Lost Eden's presentation are able to carry a lot of it even playing all these years later. Looking good and playing well for the era is great, but the narrative is where Lost Eden gets exuberant. Our story starts with a pterodactyl telling him his name, Eloy, and that he is old. My name is Eloy, and I am old. See? The narrative is told as an extended flashback from Eloy, who tells us that a tyrant, Morcus Rex, is invading, and quote, The trust that had once united humans and dinosaurs was lost. I can only imagine the politics. There are many atheists that point to dinosaurs as their reason to have become atheists. <gasps> Did he say what I think he said? In a celebration of prepositional phrases, we embody Adam, son of King Gregor and Prince of the Citadel of Moe, on the day of his coming of age. Why they couldn't come up with a better name than Moe, I don't know, but you go talk to your dad and see young Aloy is there, with bad news. Basically, the Tyran, or T-Rex people, led by Morcus Rex, have attacked and destroyed a nearby region, and everyone you come across is like, Adam, you can't leave the castle. I know you've always wanted to, but you can't. You haven't forgotten. Your mother and sister were killed by the Tyrant, have you? It's too dangerous. You can't do it, Adam. And you know, at first I was like, fine, that makes sense. I shouldn't go out there and get myself killed. But they wouldn't shut up about it. Forget your dreams of exploring the world. So I take the first opportunity to leave the castle. This is by following a tip from Aloy, who also gifts me a mysterious stone, and I go and meet a talking dinosaur, creatively named Dinah, who says I need to speak with her dying grandfather, Tao. To summarize a lot of lore you learn by exploring the castle, talking to an old man named Monk, and talking with Tao, you learn Adam's great-grandfather, called the Architect, was responsible for resisting and pushing back the last invasion of the Tyran because he built these citadels they just couldn't conquer. 
His son, and Adam's grandfather, called the Enslaver, hated dinosaurs and destroyed all the citadels but Mo to, I don't know, be the best on the block or something, which caused the secret to building these powerful structures to be lost. However, the architect had a dinosaur buddy named Grah that was able to hide the secret within the citadel of Mo. You learn all this before Tao gives you a shell, the canonical hint system I mentioned earlier, and have one of those it's my time monologues before he just dies right in front of you. Dinah takes it well and you're there to comfort her. I don't know, but Dinah and Adam may have something sparking between them. We'll see. Well, in taking a tooth from Tao that apparently belonged to one of Adam's ancestors that's embalmed in the basement, you and Dinah move past Monk and reinsert the tooth like you're treating your ancestor like one of those secret bookshelves in an old mansion, and a secret passageway opens. Moving through what looks like the Chamber of Secrets, you learn the secret of building citadels. It's not a blueprint or a material, it's just that dinosaurs and humans have to work together. The secret is teamwork and communication, the foundations of any successful relationship. You get a flute, which is supposed to help you build citadels, and Monk gives you a tablet that shows Morcus Rex on the other side, functioning like a palantir from Lord of the Rings. He mocks and taunts you, and in response you get ready to set off to build citadels and reclaim the world. Here's a good spot to break for spoilers, so if you're interested in delving into this fantastical story yourself, jump forward to the time on screen just to hear my finishing thoughts. Y'all doing okay? I appreciate you. The next region is Shamar, in which you'll be joined by Mungo. This is Mungo, Adam. He and I are mated. Dang, rip my heart out. This guy? Really? Anyway, I'm gonna scamper through the next part of the story as you'll mainly be doing the same thing in each of the next four regions, but let's meet the locals. You meet the Shorians, kind of monkey people with awesome hair, then the natives of Uluru, followed by the Amazon women of Koto, for the people out there who like their ladies, copied and pasted, and lastly, the orc-like Tamnians, like your buddy Thug from Mo, who are led by an ethereal person named Tulumi in some purple BDSM getup. Your goal is to explore each area, find those locals, locate the invading tyrants, and find the native Brontosaurus. While Eloy will go away searching for news, the local leader will join you as you explore, the Tyrans, who look a lot more like raptors than T-Rexes, will eat you if you stick around, Clever girl. <clears throat> and the Brontosauri will start building the local citadel if you play them a song and give them a mushroom, a gift that is apparently such a significant action that it's considered a fulfillment of their prophecies and you're entered as an epic hero in their lore. Okay. That said, the local Tyrans will encroach and stop their construction, so fight them off by buying the loyalty of the local Velociraptor camp. Despite looking more like T-Rexes than the Tyrans, you can give them gold you find near the water, but they'll lose the fight without a specific item of power per area. Yes, another step. You get random items of power from the people of Uluru by returning lost ceremonial masks. As for which item of power goes to each region, you'll have to consult the local Massasaurus, water dinosaurs which you have to find in each area's body of water, and gift them apples that your buddy Thug will give you. Without the Tyran encroaching, the local Brontosauri will get back to work, but they'll now need help from Triceratops to finish. Okay, despite winning the affection of the Triceratops with an empty bird's nest, they won't do anything without a specific song to instigate their help, and your flute doesn't work. By this point, you'll end up in Tamara a region, by the way, which will trigger a text description of a battle between Adam's group and the Tyrans. Or Tyrans, I feel like I've gone back and forth. During which Mungo is missing, presumed dead. You help Tulumi and the Tamnians with their half-citadel, but in order to get to the next area, Tulumi will need a missing waystone to get across the sea to Kantura, the next area. I don't know. I think there's something up with this person. Do the vibes seem off to you? I feel like they seem off. Why are you looking at me like that? Giving Tulumi the stone Eloy gave you at the very beginning, your crew is able to cross the sea to Kantura. Look at these dinos on rafts. They're adorable. Come on. Not sure what has those dorsal fins, but you reach Kantura and Dinah says she needs to leave to look for Mungo. Fine, I respect that, but Tulumi decides to take off her crazy getup and reveal herself as Eve apparently having to disguise herself as the Tamnians would never follow a woman. This is weird for a couple reasons, as Tulumi always looked and sounded like a woman. Thanks to you and your followers, the Valley of Despair has been freed. But more importantly, she's Eve. We're Adam. The game is called Lost Eden. I guess canonically, we f Even though Adam looks 14 and Eve looks 30. United with your prophetic bride, Eve instantly gets kidnapped by the locals of Kantura, who legitimately look and sound awesome. 
Your woman has nothing to fear from us. Guys, stop calling her my woman, okay? Be cool. We haven't defined the relationship yet. You're making it awkward. Well, they want Dinah, so you have to go find and convince Dinah that Mungo is actually dead, so she'll be willing to be there for the prisoner exchange. You do this by showing her the weird looking glass prism thing you got from Monk at the beginning, in which Morcus Rex on the other side has Mungo's severed head and is gloating about killing him. Holy cow, that went 0 to 100 really quick, but seeing this, Dino accepts Mungo's death and rejoins the group. In trading Dino for Eve with the people of Kantura, they say something I am certain was never previously said in human history before this game. Our traditions require that our High Priestess be a Parathosaurus. Alright then, Dinah accepts life as their High Priestess, and you can answer three riddles from the Kantura people to gain another prism if done correctly. At this point you may have as many as four or five prisms, one of which will show Morcus Rex, and the others may show Adam's awkwardly close-up face like he opened his front-facing camera by accident, meaning you have both sides of the seeing prism. Now we gotta get back to work building citadels, and Eve can help you get the Triceratops to help finish construction, as apparently she knows the song that pushes them to work. You've seen now how much contrived fantastical bullshit we've had to do to advance the plot, but this one had me laughing and shaking my head in disappointment at the same time, like, it's dumb, right? Anyway, you finish the construction of each region's citadel, protecting that ethnic group from the Tyrans and fortifying the area, a great undertaking in pushing back the invaders despite never seeing more than three at a time. Unfortunately, finishing all five citadels will result in the scripted death of your father. Following King Gregor's death is an elaborate tangential embalming quest, where Monk and a random mute executioner have to join you into the desert to convince these priestesses to do the embalming ritual. Adam apparently can't help as he shares the same blood as his father, so Monk apparently tricks the executioner to do it and lies about it. Very weird, but it works, and the priestesses then reveal they have powerful items to help defeat the tyrant, but these can only be given to the King of Mo. Well, Adam's dad just got embalmed, making him the king, right? No, apparently. The king can only be recognized by these priestesses by a golden sword, which of course is missing. Another area opens up where you'll also need to build a citadel, this time led by a lady who looks like an 80s rocker, Shazia, who turns out to be your presumed dead sister. You start a citadel in her land, she rewards you with the golden sword, to which presenting to the priestesses will result in them giving you three instruments. Play these in conjunction with Thug and Monk to scare off the tyrant in Shazia's land and finish her citadel. So you've chased off the tyrant army, all that's left is to defeat Morcus Rex himself, to which the seeing prisms are apparently the key. We don't know how they're the key, so we go back to Mo, use the golden sword to open a secret passage behind the throne, stumble through a maze with Shazia's guidance, and reveal a big egg. Give the big egg to Aloy despite Monk's protests, and he'll invite you to the ancestral home of the pterodactyl. Here you can learn the secret of the seeing prisms by eating a poisonous root and going to dinosaur heaven. Dinosaur God, I guess, tells you to combine all six prisms to defeat Marcus Rex and sends you back to mortality. If this is seeming all very elaborate and contrived, it is, don't worry. So Marcus Rex has the last prism and his lair has become available. You march in, just finding the prison off to the right, and combine it with the other five to make a dice. Or a die. Look at that! Your cursor all game had a deep lore explanation. Aren't you satisfied? Confront Morcus, automatically defeating him, which reveals him to have been a mouse the whole game, and Mungo wasn't killed, but the image of his head being off was only a trick. I guess that explains how ridiculous Morcus looked, but Mungo runs off to be reunited with Dinah off screen, and Aloy invites you back to the pterodactyl home to see the ceremonial hatching of the big egg, apparently an omen for the future of all dinosaurs. You arrive, the egg hatches, and it's empty, signifying the death of all dinosaurs, which Eloy takes very nonchalantly. Somehow I'm not surprised. It means the future is not with dinosaurs, but with men. Our kind is old and tired. Well, we're all gonna die, so it's fine, whatever. Maybe you shouldn't speak for everyone, Eloy. So jump back to the present, and old Eloy telling the story in an elaborate flashback is really the tale of the extinction of dinosaurs, humans becoming the dominant species, and I guess, a cold open to modern society. With that, the credits roll. Talking through the plot sounds insane, as it's mostly prophetic nonsense, illogical fantasy reasoning, and non sequitur world building. 
It's a triumph what you need to do next is never confusing, as the plot seems arbitrary and contrived at the same time, justified by deep lore baloney. There's just too many ancient secrets, it has been foretold, required by tradition, the prophecy states type stuff. I have more basic questions, like how does it make any sense Morcus Rex was a mouse? Why was Monk being so sketchy, like preventing Eloy from getting the egg or tricking the executioner? Or even, why do velociraptors want gold? Is there a dino economy? With a few minor plot points never going anywhere, and the last portion of the game feeling rushed, Lost Eden's story feels like it overindulges on contrived world building to justify fetch quests, which is neither immersive or satisfying. That said, the story of Lost Eden being the secret reason for the real world extinction of dinosaurs is a cool idea, but the number of ancient secrets you solve in like five minutes is just too much. Let's welcome back our spoiler avoiders. To summarize, the story isn't terrible or painful, it's contrived and somewhat underwhelming. Lost Eden is like the combination of heavy metal and the never-ending story. All three of these properties have themes of an elaborate evil, muddled prophetic nonsense, and unnecessary boobies set to great soundtracks. Before you say Never Ending Story didn't have unnecessary boobies, I will direct you to the Sphinx scene. In a film intended for kids as young as eight, I'm not sure who approved of this. I'll admit to being a little disappointed that the intriguing world of Lost Eden was made too artificial by the overabundance of fantasy tropes, but the presentation is commendable and the gameplay is pleasantly accessible. For those who have watched videos about 90s point-and-click adventure games like Darkseed or I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream and feel their gameplay is just a little too hostile to enjoy, Lost Eden is a great entry point to the genre and era. We're already spilling into the recommendation, so in scoring Lost Eden in each of my categories and compiling a grade, it lands between Blades of Exile and Filcher in my tier recommended for genre enjoyers or the highly interested. If you like 90s adventure games, there is little to prevent you from enjoying this flashy title. It's available on Steam and GOG, runs well on modern systems, and lacks a lot of the frustrations of the era's genre standards. I wouldn't blame anyone for thinking it a bit too rudimentary or finding the story forgettable, but I'm confident that fans of the genre or anyone finding themselves highly interested after this video will enjoy Lost Eden. I want to extend a hearty retroactive thank you to Cryo Interactive for a fun, imaginative experience, Stefan Picke for impressive musical work, and you for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll see you around. I hope all is well. Thanks a lot. I am old.